Um, so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd McCallery from the company Geosyntec Consultants. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I did a bachelor's degree in geological engineering at the University of Waterloo in 86 and a master's degree in earth sciences hydrogeology in 89. Um, I came back for a PhD in chemistry five years ago and uh, my, uh, dis er, my dissertation was submitted five weeks ago and my defense is actually next week so it's premature to call me Dr. Todd Mackler but I am look for looking forward to that name for the rest of my life. Um, I've also got a certificate in university teaching also here from University of Waterloo so that's three degrees and, uh, and a diploma, all from this, my alma mater. Um, but my day job is as a consulting engineer. I work for Geosyntec Consultants. We have a company of about 1,000 people internationally, of which about 100 are in Canada. I'm one of the five founding uh, partners of the Canadian operations, and most of our employees have been hired from the University of Waterloo with one or more degrees. So it's worked very well for us in terms of the co-op program and um, and the technology development. So I'm going to talk quickly about some of our environmental applications, a couple of um, examples. Uh, Waterloo is very well known for study of chlorinated solvents in groundwater. Um, when chlorinated solvents are released to the subsurface, they vaporize and they can migrate as vapors through the subsurface and they can make their way into indoor air in, in buildings. People breathe about 20,000 liters of air a day, but we only drink about a couple of liters of water per day. So to have a um, protection against the toxic uh, effects of these chemicals, you have to have much, much lower concentrations in air than even the concentrations in water. Um, so this is a big problem uh, because these compounds can be present at very high concentrations in the subsurface. So even with the dilution in indoor air, um, we can have uh, problems with the indoor air concentrations. Um, so that's the primary focus of my business right now is monitoring uh, this vapor intrusion scenario. And how do we go about doing that? Well, as it turns out, um, it's not that easy. This is a chart of concentrations in indoor air measured on a frequent basis over time in a building that was purchased by Arizona State University as, and used basically as a research uh, facility. It's a residential property near Hill Air Force Base. And you can see that the concentrations are going up and down over time um, in a rather erratic pattern, which makes it difficult to estimate risks because we estimate risks based on long-term average exposures. Um, so how do we go about sampling in this sort of scenario? Well, one way to do it is with a passive sampling device. Uh, this is the Waterloo Membrane Sampler, as the commercial name um, has been adopted. It was developed here by Professor Tadjus Kareki and his student Suresh Sithapathy, who preceded me. Um, it can, it's, it's actually quite simple, and I like that about it. It's kind of elegant by its simplicity. It's basically a small glass vial that's about the size of the last you know, digit part of, the, of, of your small finger. It's got an aluminum crimp cap over the top of it that secures a membrane in place, and this membrane is made out of polydimethyl siloxane, or PDMS. That's the same material that's used to coat the inner lining of a GC column. So if you know anything about gas chromatography, all the chemicals go in at the same time, they all come out at different times, and the reason they come out at different times is they have different affinity for the material on the inner coating of the column that they're traveling through. Now because that affinity is very well known, we can estimate the uptake rate of permeation through that membrane to the sorbent and we can use that to quantify concentrations for a very wide range of chemicals and, and do it quite simply. Um, so this has been commercialized through our laboratory division serum, which was referred to earlier in the talk about uh, DNA sequencing. Uh, they're mostly a microbiological lab, but uh, we're commercializing this sampler through serum as well. Um, so some of the advantages of the sampler is it's smaller than conventional sampling devices by a factor of about 100, uh, which makes it easier to ship and more discreet. Um, it's simpler in terms of sampling protocols. You know, I could teach a high school kid to do the sampling. It's not complicated. Um, and we can collect long-term time-weighted average samples that give us a better representation of the long-term concentrations to which people would be exposed. And it's got several, so those are true for all passive samplers, but it's got several other advantages that are specific to the Waterloo membrane sampler, including the ability to predict uptake rates for compounds we don't know through that relationship with the uh, retention index of the chromatography. We can do total petroleum hydrocarbons and gasoline range organics. We can minimize the uh, influence of moisture because that membrane is basically made out of silicon rubber. That's the stuff that you use to caulk bathtubs and stuff like that. It doesn't transmit water very readily. Um, it's insensitive to high wind velocities and it, uh, we can modify the uptake rate if we want for different uh, specific applications. It's also small so you can put it in places you can't put larger samples and uh, it's competitive with uh, industry standards in terms of the pricing. 
Um, there have been a, a series of publications and a couple of patents on the technology, so it's fairly well established and getting uh, recognition now in the marketplace. Um, we've got a four-part series of papers that was just published this year that basically redefines the application of passive sampling for quantification of volatile organic compound concentrations in the soil. Um, and that's something that people have been working on for almost 30 years now, but never quite got it worked out, but we got it worked out. And that's kind of a nice thing to be able to say. Uh, we've done extensive uh, laboratory testing under controlled chamber conditions, so we've looked at different temperature, humidity, um, face velocity, uh, exposure duration, concentration, and so we have a pretty good understanding of the effect of those different variables on the performance of the sampler. Um, and we've done extensive field testing as well um, with additional support beyond what we've received from OCE from the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. The U.S. Department of Defense is the single largest owner of land in the world and they have a lot of their sites with uh, chlorinated solvents and other fuel hydrocarbons in the subsurface so uh, this vapor intrusion thing is a big uh, financial issue for them and they're looking for less expensive ways uh, to deal with it. In terms of performance over a range of eight orders of magnitude and concentration, we've got a pretty linear correlation to conventional sampling methods, a little bit of variability here and there, but uh, that's not entirely attributable to the passive sampler because the uh, conventional methods don't have zero variability on their own. So um, we're pretty happy with the results. Um, and we've been commercializing this, as I mentioned, for several years now. Uh, we've got uh, applications throughout uh, North America, and the numbers in each of these circles represent the number of samplers uh, deployed in each of those locations, and we've also used it in several locations overseas. It's particularly good overseas because it ships quite easily. Um, it's so small and so lightweight, but it also gets across international borders and through customs and security a lot easier than the conventional samplers, which kind of look like a bomb. Um, we've received uh, approval from the New Jersey DEP. If anybody's ever tried to get the New Jersey DEP to prove anything that's not already approved by them. It's not an easy thing to do, quite, quite, quite proud of that. Um, and I'm gonna switch now to a second topic, um, still on the subject of environmental monitoring, but a slightly different application. Um, there are 800,000 kilometers of pipelines in North America that transmit petroleum hydrocarbons in various forms, uh, liquid gas, et cetera. And they're an aging infrastructure. The average age is about 50 years, and it's not a matter of weather but a matter of when, there will be leaks. If it's a leak of gas, uh, usually large volumes are released and it's not that difficult to sense. If it's a leak of liquid, they can't sense anything less than about two barrels a day worth of leak with conventional technologies. Yet, a couple of barrels a day, if you add it up over time, can become a substantial spill. At the present time, 85% of those spills are brought to the attention of the pipeline purveyors by members of the general public, which is not good for public relations. And public relations is one of the main reasons the Keystone Pipeline hasn't progressed. So these are things that they're really interested in doing a better job. You know, they do 99.99% um, effective, effectiveness on their delivery of hydrocarbons through the pipelines. They want to add a couple more nines. So um, how do you do this? Well, what I was talking about earlier with subsurface vapors migrating upwards into indoor air has some analogies with subsurface vapors from a liquid hydrocarbon release migrating up to either ground surface where it could be detected with a sensor on a ground-based platform or possibly even higher up in the air where a drone or other some airborne uh, fixed-wing aircraft or, or uh, hover um, could potentially detect it. Um, how do you go about doing that? Well, we've done some mathematical modeling that indicates if it's airborne, it's going to be very low concentration, so you need very sensitive analytical instrument. Uh, two of the current uh, leading candidates are the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and cavity ring down spectroscopy. Unfortunately, the instruments are not small. They need to be made smaller. That's the challenge. Um, they're fairly sensitive, but the concentrations uh, that are likely to be present at the kind of heights above ground surface that you can fly a plane at are going to be so low that they would need to be improved in terms of their sensitivity as well. So what other options are available? Well, we've been working for uh, about a year now with Waterloo Environmental Bi Biotechnology, Inc. Um, they grow plants, and plants don't do well when they're exposed to hydrocarbons. They get stressed out, and they, um, what's interesting about them is they change color. So uh, chlorophyll, which gives the, clan, the, the, the green color to a plant leaf, changes to something that's more yellow, and this is um, reflected in a spectrum of wavelength of light versus the, uh, the signal that you get. So a healthy plant would look like this, and an unhealthy plant would look like that, and the difference between the two is manifested right here where the chlorophyll occurs. Or, sorry, this is healthy and that's stressed. And there's a big difference right there. So if you could tune to this wavelength, you can see that. So you can fly overhead with a camera and basically see 
the plant stress. So the idea then is you get uh, an airborne platform that's got uh, infrared imaging spectrometer. You might get an image that looks like this with uh, three different camera types at a particular period of time. And then you come back a week later and you see something that looks like this. It's like, okay, we've got some stressed plants that are right here that weren't there last week. And the nice thing about this is you could basically airborne broadcast seeds that would then become your sensors once they grow into plants. And their roots are reaching down into the subsurface where the concentrations are higher. So that amplifies the signal and brings it to ground surface where it can be visualized. So this is kind of a combination of uh, different technologies that, um, you know, when you think about monitoring 800,000 kilometers worth of pipeline, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to need some help. So there are different techniques that are being evaluated for this kind of pipeline leak thing, and I'll mention a couple just for the fun of it. Um, burying a coated fiber, fiber optic line above the pipeline can be used as a sensor. Um, unfortunate part about this is it does require an excavation to install, and pipeline purveyors are very sensitive about anybody doing any kind of digging anywhere near a pipeline, because when things go wrong, they go wrong in a really big way. Um, Another thing is uh, referred to as a membrane tube. So if chemicals are released, they permeate through the membrane. You can draw samples through the membrane. And if it takes 10 minutes to come at a certain flow rate from a certain, you can say it came from a certain distance away. You know, so that, that's another technique that people are looking at. But again, it's either got to be installed when the pipeline is or installed or through an excavation after the fact, and either, you know, which isn't always available. Uh, but there are several R&D opportunities that stem from the kind of research that I'm talking about and more. I'm trying to condense it down to 15 minutes. Um, extending out the passive sampling to other chemicals like semi-volatile organic compounds and mercury. We actually have an existing postdoctoral fellow through the MITAX program that's looking at the semi-VOCs. Um, I would love to have a small ruggedized mass spectrometer that I could use as a bloodhound to go wandering around a building and sniff out sources of VOCs. So if anybody can develop me one of those, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for one of those today. Um, Real-time monitoring at coastal ports is another big deal because pipeline um, transportation, you know, isn't progressing the way it needs to. And so alternative forms of transportation are being considered, like shipping the stuff through big ships. But then you've got to transfer from big ships to pipelines and back and forth at ports. And there's safety issues because hydrocarbons are, you know, flammable, explosive, and that sort of thing. So having real-time sensors that can monitor any kind of leak in that transfer process is something that, um, the ports are quite interested in developing and, and you know, are, are interested in funding. Um, and then the, the whole idea of robotic monitoring platforms. If somebody's going to be actually doing this monitoring, they either have to be prepared to walk 800,000 kilometers or um, get some robot to do it for them. And these day, this day and age, robotics is um, kind of replacing a lot of manual labor and, and, a lot, and, and replacing humans in situations that aren't necessarily safe. Um, so if you think about the Mars rover and what it's been able to do from how far away? a long distance. Um, you know, 800,000 kilometers worth of pipeline doesn't look so intimidating anymore. So these are the kinds of some things that we're interested in. If anybody's got ideas on any of this stuff, want to talk, I'm going to be hanging around. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Todd. That's a um, big, real challenge, uh, imminent with the 800,000 kilometers of pipeline issues to be addressed. So thank you for bringing that. No, it's there, and it, uh, thank you for pointing out some R&D opportunities related to that.